to Bumblebee, everyone. I hope you're ready to be surprised, shocked, uncomfortable, or intrigued because today's video is all about the mystifying practices of ancient cultures you won't believe. A fast horse and a soaring eagle are the wings of a nomad. This Kazakh proverb is a perfect way to start off number 10, which is the equalizer. The earliest images of falconry appear in Assyrian, Scythian, and Hittite reliefs of the 9th and 8th centuries BC. However, eagle hunting as a whole is preserved in the ancient poems of Central Asia. Asia, such as the Kyrgyz Manas epics, in which the hero's death is mourned by his horse, dog, and eagle, said to be the strongest allies of a nomad. By training these three animals to be companions, the early nomads made the harsh, unforgiving steps into a land rich with furs, foods, and cultures. And wouldn't you know it, but it looks like these nomadic societies used the three companion animals as their bridge to equality. Spectacular archaeological discoveries made in graves between 700 BC and 300 AD across ancient Scythia from Ukraine to China, confirmed men and women shared a vigorous outdoor life. Everyone rode fast horses, slung arrows with their deadly accuracy, and hunted game and defended the clan. The combination of horse riding and archery was the equalizer, because a woman on horseback is just as fast and agile as a man. This ancient way of embracing gender equality was essential for the clans migrating across the oceans of sea to survive and flourish. The remarkable female falconers found amongst the preserved Urumuki mummies are over two millennia old. One woman still wears her heavy leather falconry mitten on her left hand and forearm. The exceptional size and thickness match the distinctive protective mitt worn by falconers and eagle hunters in the same region today, which there are about 250 of and a handful of young eagle huntresses that are keeping the ancient tradition alive. The Living Ghosts of Benin is up next, coming in at number 9. Living Ghosts, properly called Egangan, is a visible manifestation of the spirits of the departed ancestors who periodically visit visit the human community for remembrance, celebration, and blessings. This tradition is practiced by the Yoruba in West Africa and by extension, their descendants in Brazil, Cuba, Barbados, the United States, and the Dominican. The appearance of living ghosts in the community is a marker of a few different things. Leadership purposes, like whenever a new king is enthroned or to flaunt the wealth of the king. For military purposes, acting as a morale booster, the Agangan masquerade supports and follows the soldiers to the battlefield. And when held theatrically, which appears to be the most common it's to entertain and commemorate the celebration of an individual within the community, in which case the living ghost may be here to bless, protect, warn, or punish. It all depends on how the relatives neglect or honor their ghostly memories. The appearance of living ghosts comes with pageantry, drumming, dancing, singing, vibrant colors and costumes, and they also came with village minders, who yielded long sticks for the sole purpose of warding the ghosts away from the living populace. This is because the long-standing belief that should a living ghost touch you, you were gonna die soon. Communities will dodge and dive away from the figures, terrified of any contact as others tried to ward them away. These festivals would last several days, uniting the community with one another, but also the memory of ancestors and the reality of death. And speaking of unique festivals, let's do the horn dance for number eight. This tradition comes to us from Abbots Bromley, an English folk village found in Staffordshire, England. The origins of this one are a little murky, so it seems historically the community itself believes believes the dance was first performed at the Bethlehemy Fair near Burton-on-the-Trent in 1226. However, it wasn't first put on written record until 1686. Scientists thought they'd clear up the whole issue by just carbon dating the large reindeer horn antlers carried by the dancers. But psych, they carbon dated to be around 1065, so it didn't clear up anything. That is the time period of the Norman Conquest, however, and there are references in the Bible to wearing deer horns as a symbol of strength, so who really knows? Anyways. The horn dance itself, an ancient fertility celebration that's believed to also be part of a pagan hunting ritual. It takes place every year on the Monday that follows the first Sunday after September 4th. That is wildly specific. They start at 8 a.m. with religious service at St. Nicholas Church where the horns are housed after the 12 male dancers begin on the village green, out into the village, down the road, and all the way to Blissfield Hall, where they remain until the procession returns at 8 p.m. Be sure to settle down, otherwise you'll be a single cinnamon heart. It's number seven. This is a pretty fun one, pun intended, to spice up the mix. So, this tradition came around in Denmark during the 1700s when there was a specific career of spice salesmen, a unisex job, and they would travel all around selling spices and seeing the country. But in the process, these men and women were left single, hardly in one place long enough to truly settle down. Well, the family and friends of these unmarried yet gasp aging individuals created a ritual that's both teasing and quite persuasive to hurry the hell up and 
settle down. The cinnamon toss. If you're still single at 25, your family and friends would get together, grab you, and restrain you. First, they'd splash water all over you and then cover you head to toe in a cloud of cinnamon. If you cross 30 and are still single, the level of torment increases. The cinnamon's replaced by pepper, and instead of being doused with water, they may use whisked eggs to help stick the spices better. If you thought this was some kind of punishment for being single, you're so wrong. It's just a fun custom that friends and family of these people did to prank them with. Does it happen nowadays? Yes, not everyone does it, but when they do, it's definitely a lot funnier and potentially way less traumatic than back in the day. Speaking of love marriages and baby carriages, number six is utagaki. So utagaki was a Japanese Shinto social ritual in which villagers would meet on mountaintops and interact with one another in a few ways. There would be singing, dancing, colorful sashes and ribbons, adorning rock and tree surfaces. Food was prepared en masse, conversation was shared, and intercourse had. This was all in the namesake of offering tribute to their gods, bringing fertility to women, virility to men. They were excellent and encouraged grounds of exploration, physically, mentally, and spiritually. And as a result, many unmarried peoples attended to potentially meet their spouse. Eventually, the rituals were outlawed by the reigning Buddhist government for their excessive unruliness, which is code for the Shinto are throwing a boozed out rage romp and we don't like it. So despite this, the tradition did continue and it does today in certain areas of Japan, although minus the adults doing adult things, or at least that's what they tell us. Two cultures shared number five, which is meditating on death. In their early years, the Chinese believed that the soul was composed of multiple parts and after death dissipated, therefore never truly perpetuating the existence of the deceased. Talk about stressing yourself out about death, eh? The conclusion was that the only way to keep these soul parts together and thus continue living in a spiritual form past death was to leave your body intentionally, requiring awareness at the moment of death. That's not a hard bargain to drive as not to freak you out, a decent amount of us do die aware that that's what's happening. But some people went pretty hard with it. For example, the Cha'an monks who sat meditating until they died so as to be naturally mummified in a meditative posture. They above all else were believed to have truly mastered this perfect form of death. The ideology then entered into Japan where it was absorbed by the Shugendo tradition. Between 1081 and 1903, at least 17 monks managed to mummify themselves this way. But there may be more whose bodies we simply haven't recovered. Over in India, we have number four, the Great Head Washing. Super strange name, less strange festival with context. Or is it? Man, who am I to decide? So this all starts with the commissioning of a 17 meter high monolith of Bahubali, a revered deity amongst the Jain people of India who believe he lived around 20,000 years ago and that during his time, he challenged his brother Bharat to fight to determine who would reign supreme over the kingdom of Abhanasa, rather than having a large scale war where unnecessary life is lost. Bahubali had distinct physical advantage. The man was supposedly huge with really big arms. So his smaller brother, Bahara, tried to cheat. The action did not go unnoticed and Bahubali is furious. He raises his enormous fist intending to pummel the smaller man before freezing. Bahubali thought, what am I doing? Am I going to kill my elder brother for the sake of worldly possessions that my revered father has willingly abandoned and which my other brothers have given up? Mortified, Bahubali discarded all his clothes as penance, pulled out his hair and sat naked and motionless meditating for a year until he overcame all defiling passions and descended off the elephant of ego. Now a festival celebrates this event with the statue's big bald head being washed for 10 days straight by around 2 million devotees. This washing is considered so auspicious that in 2006 a prominent Jain man bid 1.3 million dollars to be the first to wash Bahubali. This festival is held every 12 years and the last one was in 2018. So two cultures once again unite over an odd tradition? Number three is spit shine the bride. So the Maasai people of Kenya are among the oldest clans inhabiting the African Great Lakes region, still practicing ancient traditions, customs, and culture that haven't been swayed by our modern world. One example is spitting for luck and even to show respect. This could be traders spitting in their palms before shaking hands on an agreement or rubbing some on the forehead of a newborn. But what this culture shares with the Greeks is spitting on the bride. Newly Weds and Maasai culture will seek out the father of the bride, who by spitting on his daughter's head and 
chest grants his blessing. Directly afterwards, the bride must turn from him and leave with her new husband and can't turn around under any condition, elsewise it's believed she could turn to stone. And evidently, Greeks agree with this. Well, at least the spitting part, but I will say the story of Orpheus retrieving his wife from the underworld is very similar. The only place they differ on spitting, however, isn't just dear old dad who gives you the at the Greek weddings, but every single person who attends just raining spit down on you as you walk down the aisle. And it's not just their weddings, Greeks follow this custom for other traditions too, like baptisms. Now on to number two, which is physical grief. For the women of the Dani tribe, the emotional grieving of a recently deceived loved one does not end with emotion, rather ikipalen, which is a tradition where the fingertips of grieving women are cut off. So the fingers in the Dani tribe mean unity, strength, and the clan itself. As the fingers unite and work together, the ability to function properly with some missing fingers represents the hollow and diminishing strength of a family. This act would also usually be done by another family member. Nowadays, and in the later times, that was done with a stone blade. However, I'm about to get very squeamish, as it can be done without equipment, i.e. they weaken the knuckle by chewing on it and use a piece of string tied uh, to cut off the circulation. The nerves and muscles die from lack of oxygen and the dying portion of the finger falls off. In ancient times, uh, whatever sharp stones around were used to forcefully break the phalanx and then the wound was immediately uh, cauterized. Some people cut off their ears as well or smeared themselves in river sludge for a week without taking a bath. This means the dead have returned to nature. I'd, I'd prefer that one. Although the practice was forcefully stopped years ago by the Indonesian government, many older female Danny members' hands are walking relics. Last but not least, the advanced astronomers are number one. Marcel Curiel, the anthropologist, is part of two ethnographic expeditions, one in 1928 and another in 1933, where he came in contact with the elusive African clan, the Dogon. Residing in the desert near Mali and the border of Burkina Faso, they escaped from these lands to avoid the expansionists of the medieval empires. Despite the Dogon having come into contact with our civilization in fairly recent times, they possessed incredible scientific and astronomical knowledge knowledge that shocked Marcel. Some of this knowledge was certainly the result of cultural heritage that is a millennia old, but one element in particular has decidedly current characteristics, the detailed knowledge of the star Sirius. The Dogon are aware that Sirius was a binary system of two stars, that Sirius B revolves around Sirius A with an elliptical orbit and over a period corresponding to 50 years. The most discerning of discoveries was that the Dogon knew the exact position of Sirius A with in the ellipse. That's what makes this literally awe-inspiring, because it's only in 1862 that colonized society discovered Sirius B, and it was with the most advanced telescope of the era. Even then, we didn't have true confirmation of it before 1970, yet the Dogon knew of it hundreds of years before. But there's more mystery, because they also know that the planet Saturn has rings and put it in their depictions. They knew that the planet Jupiter has four moons, and they knew that the Earth was a sphere that revolved on an axis, alongside other revolving spheres that surrounded the sun. All of these things required incredibly high-tech advancements for us to discern, but to them it was nothing. My favorite bit of knowledge is when asked how they and their ancestors determined these things, the Dogon explained that they simply just know. Alrighty, that's the end of another video. Thank you so, so much. I hope you enjoyed, and be sure to like and subscribe to see more from us. And until next time, remember your roots, viewers. You are your ancestors' hopes and dreams. Never waste that.